Good afternoon, everyone. It's always the lucky spot to have um, the last session at a conference, so it's great to see so many people still here and um, very excited to have the chance to talk to you about our organisation um, and an organisation that's driven by parental engagement and with our current work in the area of supporting families of kids with developmental disabilities, parental engagement and how we create school communities that support all parents to be engaged and all parents who want to fulfil their responsibilities as parents in relation to schools. Um, and so I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about my organisation and some of the work we've been doing in relation to schools. And then Katie Perpich, who's um, a mother and who's a member of our organisation, is going to tell you a bit about her experience as a parent. Um, I have cause for a bit of celebration today. Yesterday we heard um, an update on the um, education funding reform campaign, the Gonski reform. Any of you who are aware of the um, work that's been done in Australia towards the development of a national disability insurance scheme might not know that today we had an announcement by Prime Minister Rudd that Western Australia, the last outstanding state, has today announced that it will support a national disability insurance scheme in WA. Thank you. And we will have three launch sites in, in this state, one in the Lower South West, one in the um, Coburn, Quinana area and one in the Eastern Hills area. So this is a very exciting day for us. It's been something that my organisation has worked towards for 25 years and it's all because of parental engagement. So thank you very much for WAXO for giving us the opportunity to come and talk to you today. I was really inspired by the school presentations we had yesterday and the emphasis on the relationship between um, the leaders of the school, the principal and the teachers and with, um, with parents as communities. One of the things I didn't hear about was whether families of kids with disabilities, how they were engaged as part of that school and I was really inspired to hear those stories and, and hoping that we can um, start a conversation today about how our, our school communities are engaging all of our, all of our families. Do I press the green? I've heard people say the green button is the one to press, is that right? Okay. So under the theme of parental engagement, the subheading I wanted to give our um, presentation today was expectations and experiences. I wonder if um, you can all cast your mind back to the days before um, your child, your first child started their education journey. Maybe think about, particularly because you're all parents of um, our public schools, that your school was probably a very key part of your community. It was probably somewhere, as my daughter's school is, that we walked past a lot before she was even on her school journey. And in my mind, I'd created a whole idea of what our experience was going to be like. We were going to be part of a new community. It was going to be a new journey, not just for her, but also for me as a parent. I was going to meet new people. She was going to meet new people. She was going to learn and grow and develop and have a very rich life. She was going to learn. She was going to have social opportunities. She was going to um, have all of these opportunities. And I was going to be part of that too. I was going to be able to be part of sharing who she is and how she learns and how she achieves. And we were all going to be part of that journey as a family. So that was my expectation. I wonder if any of you got to school and maybe found that your expectations and your hopes and your dreams for that journey for yourself and for your child weren't quite what you were hoping for. It might have been because you as a parent were struggling with maybe some health issues or other personal issues and for some reason weren't able to be engaged as you wanted to be or didn't quite feel part of, as part of things as you wanted to be. Or perhaps there were some things happening for your child that meant that school life didn't quite look um, for them the way that you had hoped. They don't have, kids don't have to have a disability to have those experiences. There are many kids for whom school isn't quite the experience that we hope. So I thought parental engagement, expectations and experiences was a good way for me to frame um, the, the, the conversation that I wanted to have with you today and that, um, that Katie will also share in her personal journey as a parent. So a little bit about DDC. DDC stands for the Developmental Disability Council of Western Australia. We're a not-for-profit organisation and we've been around for 25 years. We emerged out of what is now known as the Active Foundation, um, who is one of the a very large um, provider of specialist disability supports in our state. 
Um, that was an organisation that was originally created by parents, by parents who wanted something different than the um, either institutional care that was available for their sons and daughters in the days when we put people away, people with disabilities inst into institutions and they weren't part of our community. Parents who wanted to be engaged in their kids' lives and who wanted, to, to, wanted something different to be about, available for their child and their family. And we have emerged as a separate organisation um, over the last 20 years from the Active Foundation. We're the peak advocacy organisation in WA, so we act to provide a collective voice for the experience of intellectual and developmental disability in our state. Our membership includes families, it includes professionals working in the area, it includes support groups that are active in our community, and it also includes organisations that provide supports to people. So that's why we also call ourselves a community of interest. Our vision is pretty simple, really. Um, our vision is that people with developmental disabilities and their families live their lives their way. Um, this is a young man, Mr James Davies, who's a member of ours. He's a young man with cerebral palsy. Um, he's a marriage celebrant. He's just finished his first degree at university. Um, a very active young man in his community with lots of hopes and dreams. One day he'd like to run a travel organisation specifically for people with disabilities and helping them to make their travel dreams come true. Our purpose, with, uh, which um, Kylie went through a little bit before, basically we have a model of change. We recognise that if you, want, if you want to change something that's big in our community, there's no point putting all of your effort into one small spot. So we seek to um, create lasting and positive change for the benefit of people with developmental disabilities and their families in three ways. The first is that we work directly with, um, particularly with family members, to give them a strong voice in their community, give them the communication skills and the advocacy skills that they need um, to, to be a strong voice for them and their, and their family. Um, in the education space, that has meant, for example, running our first series of advocacy skills workshops for, for parents and building on those opportunities for them to really be engaged in their child's learning by having a strong background in understanding their own child's development and education needs and being able to create constructive relationships with their school community to support those. The other aspect to our work is that we partner with others to, to develop more um, more connective and inclusive communities. One of the things that we're very interested in is working one-on-one -on -one with schools and with um, local area coordinators who are active on a local basis in supporting schools and school staff to develop inclusive communities amongst their schools that are good at communicating with all parents and understanding the different journeys that parents parents are on and helping them to be as engaged as possible as parents. Um, so that's why I really found yesterday's presentations, um, particularly from Bentley and, and Yule Brook, really engaging and exciting to see the, amount, the amazing stuff that can happen at the school community level with the right school culture and the important role that families play in setting that, cool cult that school culture and maintaining it. The other aspect of work is, our, um, is influencing government and other decision makers. I noticed one of your motions yesterday looked at the Schools Plus, um, the, the schools plus mechanism, which is the avenue at the moment, which um, schools get additional resources to support students with a disability and making sure that school that classroom teachers have a good say in the process that determines those funding levels. One of the things that um, we've observed in our experience is that the way that we have of supporting schools at the moment doesn't distinguish clearly enough between the individual learning needs of students, the needs of classroom teachers to support either an individual student and the, um, the, the, the whole class together, and also the um, collective needs of the school community in, in supporting a diverse range of students. So we're very much interested in looking, particularly now as the um, the Gonski stuff looks to flow as how, how we can really make sure that um, schools are properly resourced to support the range of students that, that are there and that families and um, classroom teachers have clear shared expectations about how those resources are used. When I came to DDC, because we were an organisation with a long history and an organisation that had done a lot of work on unmet need, our, um, while we're a representative organisation, we had a very large number of older families who had um, adult children. Um, and one of the things that I was very keen to do is to really build our um, relationship with families with younger children so that we could continue to be an active member-based organisation into the future. And when you start talking to families with school age kids, it doesn't take long for school issues to come to the fore. Um, when your kids are in, in that stage of their journey, it makes absolute sense that as a parent, that's something that's very front and centre in your mind. 
And so it became very clear to us that families wanted to have a conversation about the school experiences and, out and the learning outcomes for students with disabilities. And there was also a sense from um, the, the education community and also in the um, professional disability community that there had been a period of time in Western Australia when inclusive education, making sure that um, all of our students had the best ra possible range of education options available to them was something that was front and centre. But there was an also an observation that because of the, com the complex environment that schools were finding themselves in, because of a number of the issues that have been talked about over the last couple of days, schools feel have felt like they're under a lot of pressure. They've got lots of demands on them. And there was a very clear sense that how we can best support students with disabilities had fallen off the radar a bit. And so there was very much a sense for us of really wanting to reopen that conversation and to open it in a way that was constructive and supportive and created a sense of shared responsibility, not to have a conversation about you know, parents versus teachers or teachers versus parents, which sometimes is what, is what happens when we're talking about how best to work together. When we started this conversation with, um, with families, we wanted to be very clear that we wanted it to be a constructive conversation. We wanted it to be something that would give us something that we could work with in our relationships across communities. We didn't want it to be to kind of get sucked down this rabbit hole, which can very often happen about how difficult sometimes um, some families with, of kids with disabilities find the experience of interacting with schools. And for many, it is a very difficult and challenging experience. Some have wonderful experiences, I have to also say. And of course, it's largely dependent on the particular school and the, and the, the relationship that people are able to um, build with their school. Um, I think that the, pr the principal from um, formerly of Valdivis and now of Beaconsfield yesterday really emphasised how important the leadership of principals is and, if as, and how as parents, it's really important that if you want something as a PNC to happen in your school, you really need to have that good relationship with your principal. So what we did was we asked families to describe to us what their ideal education system was. And it was really interesting to us that when we did that, there was nothing particular about disability. Parents didn't actually talk about the specifics of their child's disability. They talked about the kind of universal themes that came up yesterday. I was keeping track of the kind of language that we were using yesterday and talking through the great examples that we had of parental engagement yesterday and it's all about communication and relationships and inclusiveness and ongoing contact and community and creating a sense of being one big family. The themes that emerged in our conversation was that families felt that an ideal education system would welcome all children and their families. They described that an, an ideal education system would be one that communicates effectively, openly and often, that values families as partners in their child's education and nothing speaks more, more strongly to your theme of parental engagement than that. The fourth aspect families talked about was that an ideal education system would provide safe and secure learning environments. For many families with people with, particularly with intellectual disabilities, safety and the need for protection in some instances is something that's important. And building actually on our last speakers, it's a very sad reality that children with intellectual disabilities in particular are the most vulnerable children when it comes to um, sexual abuse. Parents imagined that an ideal education system would be one that provides child-centred, timely and holistic education and supports. So that means seeing a child as part of, an under of a family and understanding the different things that are happening in their lives. And we're very appreciative of the fact that the more pressures that schools feel are placed on them, the harder it is to provide that kind of child-centred and holistic environment. And again, great to hear some examples yesterday of how, how schools were doing that effectively. The sixth aspect um, for an ideal education system that um, our families talked about was that it would be one that implements best practice and ongoing staff professional in development. There's a huge amount of expectation on the curriculum that our teachers go through as they learn to be teachers. And I'm a firm believer that actually there's not, you don't get a huge amount of value of, out of cramming so, too much into that early um, curriculum for educators. That the best of time to um, give people information that they need is when it's useful to them. So for a school community or for a particular teacher, that you're getting information about how to best support students with disabilities at the time that you need it, at the time that's relevant to them. I don't know if you, any of you have ever done Excel training or any kind of computer training, but if I do Excel training or anything like that when I'm not using it, it just goes out the window. It only becomes relevant to me when I'm, I'm trying to get something done. 
and I think that taking that approach would take a little bit of the pressure off um, the, the, uh, the uh, learning teacher curriculum. This, the um, final aspect was one that really values and fosters community inclusion. There's a bit of a saying in the disability world that inclusion means all. Um, and I think that's a big part of our message today is, is having a conversation about how our school communities are including all of the members of that school community. So our, role, our work in this is really about helping parents to feel supported in the choices they make about their children's education. Families of kids with intellectual disabilities in particular have a range of options available to them. Some families the priority really is they want their child to attend their local school because they want their child to be part of their local community. They want their child to be visible in their local community so that when it comes time for their child to be out in the workforce after life at school ends, that it's become the norm that people expect to see people with, with disabilities in their communities and in their workplaces. And they want their kids to be going wherever possible to the school that their siblings go to. They want their, their, they want their family to be able to feel part of that community as well. But families also face the real reality that for some kids the, level, the, the nature of their child's disability means that an ed support centre for, for the, that child's schooling for, or for a part of that child's schooling is, is the best choice for that family at a particular time. And for other families as well, um, that choice might, might mean um, their child attending um, an ed support school that, that provides specialist support for kids with disabilities. And I'm very proud to be a member of the Durham Road um, school board, which is a, a school that supports um, children with intellectual disabilities from kindy right through to year 12. So families have a range of choices that, are, that they're having to navigate as parents and finding the right fit for their child. And sometimes that, that journey is very clear, but other times it's, it's not. And for us, it's really about how can we work with families and also with, com with school communities to make those choices as easy and as clear and as supported as possible. And I noted the, um, the item that you had yesterday about the parent and child responsibility. Our focus at the moment is on families who are really engaged. We also recognise that we have a number of families who are under a lot of pressure because of socioeconomic issues often, for whom engaging with school is quite secondary at the moment to just keeping a roof over their head and getting through the day with the number of pressures that are on their families. But for many of the families we work with, they are truly engaged and what they're wanting to do is share their knowledge and their experience of their child with their school community to help be part of um, getting the best educational experience and outcomes for their kids. Our work is also about helping parents to feel they have the skills to work alongside their school community. So for us that means supporting families to have good communication skills. Um, it's no good having a huge amount of knowledge and experience if you aren't able to establish a good relationship with your teacher and if you're finding yourself in constant conflict with them. For many of our families, by the time they get to school there have been so many other pressures in their lives that they're, they're sometimes feeling like they're quite emotional about a situation and that often makes it hard to have a conversation about what's happening in the classroom. So for us it's about equipping um, families of kids with disabilities with good communication skills um, and also though wanting to work alongside teachers and school communities so that they are able to be receptive to that as well. Communication is a two-way process and we all need to have those skills if we're going to communicate effectively. And it was very clear from the examples we had yesterday that schools are really working hard on creating the kind of environments that value communication and also support both staff and parents to have good communication. We think it happens naturally but it turns out it needs a bit of effort. I might have got to. Oh, I did. So that's the end of my, um, my presentation. Just give you a little bit of a sense of, um, of who we are as an organisation, how we're looking at the experience of education for people with dis developmental disabilities and their families and the opportunities that lie ahead. Um, our immediate focus in the last 12 months has been working directly with families, but we're really keen to start working and building relationships with school communities who are keen to make their schools as inclusive as possible um, and who are, who are wanting to engage um, more with families in their school who have children with disabilities um, so that they can get the best outcomes for their kids. And I'd like to welcome Katie Perpich to talk a bit about her experience as a parent. Hi everyone. Um, could I just get a show of hands just in the room here? 
if any of you are parents of children with special needs? Yeah, quite a few. And, and how many of you, if you're not parents of kids or carers of kids with special needs, have a friend or a sibling who is and so has a strong, yeah. So this is what you've got. You've got your converted. <laughs> you've got the engagers right here because I guess most of you have obviously had um, an experience of your own or the exposure to the experience of people that you care for where um, the exercise of engaging your children within, with their community or yourselves with community is something other than an unconscious one. It's had to become self-conscious because some barriers have perhaps become obvious um, quite early on and in this context in relation to your um, engagement with the school community. So I'm um, a parent of three children. My nine-year-old is intellectually disabled and autistic and epileptic. Um, she, fortunately, she has the, not just the trifecta, but she also has the anaphylaxia to nuts as well. So <laughs> we're covered on everything. Um, and, and my six-year-old is, and she's in year, so my nine-year-old's in year four at her local um, primary school um, with a teacher's age 50% of the time. And my six-year-old is a, whatever, what I would, some people would call normal, but I would say merely undiagnosed um, child who is in year one. And my experience for those two children has been radically different. And I think it does speak to um, the need in the community, I suppose, to have more understanding about um, disability and caring for disability in order for those experiences perhaps to be less radically different from each other. Um, when I went to school with my, um, my nine-year-old now, um, she went to her local school initially and um, she was still incontinent uh, slightly, uh, but slightly is enough to be disastrous, um, and she was only just verbal. Um, and she threw tantrums quite a lot. And so it's fair to say that she was not somebody that the other children particularly wanted to be friends with, um, so she didn't get any play date invitations and she didn't get any birthday party invitations for that year. And that had a profound implication for my engagement with the school because she couldn't tell me what she was doing at school. She didn't really have the, the capacity to explain what was going on in her school. Um, the teachers would tell me a little bit about what was going on in terms of their program for her, but um, I didn't meet any parents because I had no occasion to. Um, I didn't get to any of the parties where the kids were going with their parents. I didn't go to any of the... We didn't have any play dates. I didn't have any of those opportunities to really connect with any of the school community. And I felt incredibly isolated from that experience. And actually, for lots of reasons, um, but partly because of that, I moved her to a school that was um, specially purpose-built to cater for kids with special needs. And she went there for three years. But that was 20 kilometres away from where we lived. So that meant that although the school culture was far better and there were actually, she did get invited to a couple of birthday parties there, and there was, I think, a much better sort of educational support program going on in the classroom, I couldn't practically facilitate any informal social engagement for her through my connection with the families again because I was just practically too far away. And so... I had to make a decision and I guess I put it off a bit until my second child went to school and she went to her local primary school. Now she is normal, she's socially engaging, she's got a twinkle in her eye, she's blonde with blue eyes and she was a very popular little girl. She's kind of annoying now so maybe she's not as popular but then she hadn't quite sort of got right into the bossy stride so she was kind of precocious without being irritating. Anyway. Um, so she was popular and she got invited to all of the parties and she got invited to lots of play dates and I got, inv I got connected with the community all of a sudden. And funnily enough, there was, a, you know, there was a number of us that had three years between children, so there were a number of parents that had essentially kind of wouldn't want to be here, now wanted to be my best friends. And they are my best friends and I don't have any bitterness, or I sort of sound like I do, but I don't have any bitterness about that. What happened was... At the time that I was there with my little girl, I was stressed for lots of reasons. I was working and I was worried about her, her needs and I was busy with meetings with the school and meetings with the teacher and all my engagement was caught up in sort of the special needsy part of her existence. 
and they didn't feel that they knew what to do or how to bring um, themselves into my life or bring me into their lives. They felt that they had a special need that they couldn't um, meet in, in our relationship and so they kind of backed away. They just left, left well alone. But when it was really easy with my normal daughter and it was all straightforward and it was just obvious kind of play dates around the park and all of that, we became friends. And through that, through that then process, I ended up becoming involved in the PNC, becoming the president of the PNC. My um, older daughter is now back at the school and it's been a very different experience socially for her. Still have a few issues with the academics, but essentially we made the decision that as Taryn mentioned, it, we wanted our children all to be at the same school and to be part of a community that would continue to foster her. And so I guess what I'm saying is that that social interaction, that informal stuff that we don't talk about, you know, the stuff that we all experienced ourselves when we were at school about being the popular kid or the unpopular kid and being the in or the out crowd, that stuff really hurts and it still hurts today. And so, and it has a profound implication for the way in which we build community and the way in which we engage. Because I wouldn't have thought for one second about becoming involved in the PNC with the degree of, I guess, isolation and um, ostracism that I was experiencing. Well, I probably wasn't. It wasn't conscious, it wasn't deliberate, but that's how I experienced it. Um, and so two, I want to say two things about that. One I want to say is, I'm sure people here do this already, but I think the message needs to be about say hello. If you see a parent sitting under a tree with a difficult child, Go and be present with that parent, even if you don't know them, and say, can I help, or hi, or is there anything I can do, or just introduce yourself, because that parent can't do it. They're dealing with a difficult situation, or, or they've got another child that needs some help. And I think we have to overcome our own shynesses and our own feeling of inadequacy and our own feeling that we're going to do the wrong thing or put our foot in the wrong place, and just step in and step up a little bit to be there for each other on that informal social level. Um, and I also think that as members of PNCs, we need to be conscious that these parents become invisible in the community um, for lots of reasons, partly because they're dealing with the special needs aspects for their children, but also because um, special needs brings costs. And so often families that may not have two working parents might decide to have two working parents in order that they can pay for the therapy. I mean, I think I paid... Well, I paid, we got the autism funding, which was $12,000 over two years, and we spent that in six months. And then we spent the equivalent of a mortgage for the next three years on autism therapy and there was no more financial support for that and has never been. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's money that's there, but, it, it, you know, I worked for that. I wouldn't have worked, but I did. Um, and so we're busy doing that. Not my, fortunately not my marriage, but lots of marriages break down under the stress of disability in the family. And so that, that creates more insecurity, discomfort, unavailability. And so there's this invisibilitization that occurs, if that can be a word, um, for a lot of parents with, with kids with special needs. And so I think the rest of the community needs to step up a little bit to foster those parents' engagement. But on the flip side, I think that children, parents with kids with special needs can engage in the formal spheres, such as the PNC and the council, really meaningfully um, to inform communities about stuff they just didn't know about and to give them permission to be help, to helpful and to give permission to feel good about the kind of community they're going to build together. And I, and I think that <laughs> the formal mechanisms, although you can feel it inhibited from joining them because you don't feel like you're the popular kid on the block, by just crashing through that and going through the formal systems, inevitably you will then meet people, inevitably you will then become members of the fundraising committee or whatever, and, and unfortunately the parents of kids with special needs will all know this, you have to step up even more. Even though no one handed you out special time to deal with your special needs, you have to just find more, you have to sleep one less hour, you have to do whatever it takes to, to get into that community and build it, because for our, my kid, who cannot um, as easily build her own community, that's my responsibility as a parent. And I guess what I would ask this community and my community and any community that I feel a member of is help me out here because I didn't get any kind of brochure when Eloise turned up as Eloise. I didn't get any kind of extra help or any time. I mean, I got there's all the institutional help, but I don't have any idea. And some of my best friends have said to me, so, so what should I do when Eloise does this? And I go, I don't really know. I don't know. <laughs> um, sometimes I yell at her and sometimes I let her sit it out and usually it's depending on how much time I've got. So um, 
No parent with a, person, with a child with special needs has all the answers. They've got experiences, they've got ideas, they've got stories to tell, and they would love your help, and they would love you to say, I want to sign on, and I want to um, invite you to be part of the PNC, I want you to invite to come and speak to the PNC about your experience. Even that can make a parent feel involved. So that's really, I mean, I've got lots of other things I could talk about, about um, the engagement that children, parents like me have with the education department, but I think it's probably more useful just to hear about what people do in, in their own environments. So hopefully that's meant something to you all. <laughs> Thank you for listening.